because it takes some time. And we are live! Oh my gosh! Hello everybody, I'm here today with Elena, who is a wonderful human being and a developer um, at Airbnb. Hi! Oh my gosh! Oh, sorry. Hello, Thank you everybody. so much for being here. I'm, I just had an echo from, my, uh, from already the live starting because it's two minutes delayed, so I had to turn that off. But um, I'm so happy that we're doing this. Um, Elena is uh, backend goddess by day and a blockchain expert by night. Um, <laughs> We actually met at a, a, at a East Denver hackathon uh, where, where she was doing a workshop on how to create your non-fungible token. So when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, Elena, like, <laughs> we need to talk. So I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting me. This is really exciting. Very, very, very exciting. And um, for everybody um, who is new to this world, we're going to talk about non-fungible tokens, uh, what they are, their history, and then Elena is going to do a little demo of the project that she's been working on. Uh, you can find the link in the description. Um, yeah, we'll just, I guess, go straight into it. Okay, what, what questions do you have? Yeah, so Elena, can you please tell us about the difference between the fungible tokens, I guess, and non-fungible tokens. What is this non-fungible token animal and how is it different to the other? Yeah, no, that's totally, uh, that's totally a great question. So um, we have a lot of cryptocurrencies and a lot of them are actually tokens on top of Ethereum. So if you have ever heard of like Augur or, or Tron or you can't think of that many, but <laughs> there's like a lot of these ERC-20 tokens and these are basically smart contracts that represent a token. And these are called fungible tokens because they're like money. So it doesn't matter if I give you, you know, like this dollar bill or like that dollar bill. It's all the same if the value of that particular currency is the same. Um, Non-fungible tokens are super exciting because uh, one token differ differs from another. So, uh, you know, there's like a lot of crypto kitties in this world, <laughs> but not all crypto kitties cost the same. Uh, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with crypto kitties. But uh, it's basically this massive game on the Ethereum blockchain. They were the first to kind of pilot this non-fungible token standard. Um, and they completely crushed it. I mean, this game, I think at this point, this game has been live for four months, I think. And it has more than like $300 in transactional volume. So like 300, 300 million, sorry, $300 million of people trading these cats. Um, so it's kind of a big deal and it kind of like opened the doors to other people exploring, making their own games or applications in Ethereum blockchain. Um, and yeah, I think like there's a ton of opportunity there. Yeah. Uh, the, oh, cool. just for people who don't know, uh, what crypto kitties are, that this is the link to them. You can read more about them, but yeah, $3 million in transactions. That's 300. Sorry. 300 million. 300 million. That yeah. is insane. And guys, they're basically buying these cats <laughs> and, and breed these cats, which are unique, so you can collect them. So mm -hmm. how, does, um, how does a token like this uh, create, get a value? You know, like, how do people determine how much this cat will be? That's an excellent question. I mean, the philosophical answer to that is, you know, how do people put value on anything? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, how do people put value on collectibles? You know, uh, there was a time in our lives where Beanie Babies cost, you know, used to cost a lot of money. And I think they still do, actually. Like, that's kind of how eBay actually got their popularity back in the days because people would sell these Beanie Babies for like $3,000 on eBay. Um, you know, people collected stamps. People collected art. Uh, you know, <clears throat> people put value in these collectibles for whatever reason, because they feel emotionally attached or because there's like this human nature of collecting. Um, so the short answer is I don't know, but this behavior has obviously been seen, you know, not just in the blockchain. Uh, it's not just the hype of, you know, Ethereum or cryptocurrency in general. People have been wanting to collect collectibles for, you know, since the birth of human, <laughs> of human civilization, basically. So it's kind of an interesting human behavior that we're seeing now on the Ethereum blockchain. Fair enough. That is very, very interesting and very true that people have always been trying to collect things. The first thing that comes to my mind is stamps, right? Yeah. And I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, 
the way, because I like to visualize things. And when we had our <laughs> uh, first call, we were talking about these things. Um, I would visualize cryptocurrencies as money, something mm -hmm. that you exchange for an equal amount of value. So for example, you, like you said, $1 is equal to $1, mm -hmm. $20 is equal to another $20. And if we go into other currencies, it's the same thing, mm -hmm. right? They have the same amount of value per unit. While um, non-fungible tokens are this stamp, equivalent exactly. stamps. And I guess some of them are, and yes, there is an element of stamps being used for sending letters, but <laughs> stamps in the um, in in this um, situation, I'm talking about stamps being collectibles. Mm -hmm. And so uh, some of them are more rare than others. And I guess that determines how valuable they are to people who really want those those for their their collections. Yeah. Exactly. And with Crypto Kitties, it's pretty obvious because they have like fancy cats and they have cats of different traits. Uh, so, and they have like founders cats, which like, you know, they have like, like zero, like the zero generation cat. Uh, so, you know, they definitely have different categories to kind of like, you know, make people more excited about owning a particular type of cat. Um, so that's, you know, that's why breeding is so fun because you're thinking like, okay, like if I put these two cats together, what if I get the cat that I want <laughs> out of it? So there's definitely a, a game element to it. Um, but yeah, it definitely feeds into like that human nature of like wanting a particular type of a collectible. Um, yeah, so I think they nailed it because they actually have a great game mechanic. Um, and yeah, and, and kind of to segue back into it, uh, after Crypto Kitties, there have been a lot of other games that have tried to copy their success. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And just uh, sorry before we go on into the crypto kitties uh, more more or less history uh -huh. um question about that i just wanted to um draw another parallel between crypto kitties and pokemon go for example oh, yeah. totally if, if you think about it people were collecting those pokemons and they were trying to get the strongest ones and exactly develop theirs and all that stuff and i guess it's just in human nature and that game aspect of things really draws people into it oh yeah yeah no the moment i saw crypto kitties explode i actually thought of the same exact thing i was like wow this is like the pokemon go of ethereum and it kind of followed the same trajectory i mean if you remember pokemon go like people were crazy about it for like maybe a month and then it kind of died out right yeah. and so for crypto kitties it's kind of the same thing like they're still doing really well don't get me wrong like they still have you know like a good amount of transactions per day but if you look at the graph i mean like it's a camel's back you know <laughs> um and yeah so the hype definitely lasted for about a month and now it's definitely not there anymore so yeah the parallel is very strong fair enough so let's go into the you know more or less the history of things and um into how crypto kitties and that um erc 721 mm -hmm. is that the um, is that the protocol is that what the protocol is called? Yeah, so the ERC721 is uh, a standard, which is kind of like Ethereum's way of saying interface. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, uh, it's a community kind of acknowledged or agreed upon standard, meaning that if you write your, your smart contract in this particular way, then we'll acknowledge that this is an ERC721, meaning that it is a contract that represents a non-fungible token. So it's very kind of like flexible. It's very soft. Like you can write your contract any way you want it, and maybe still call it ERC721 if it kind of, you know, follows some of the methods. Mm -hmm. So it's just a guideline of um, yeah. this contract. And again, I guess for me and for a lot of people, mm -hmm. the concept, the notion of contract yeah. um, in that uh, context is a little confusing. Okay. So, so let me try and explain. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let's say, uh, so this is my coffee, it's my coffee mug. Uh, let's say there is a standard for how to make mugs. And I say, in order for you to make a mug, it has to have some qualities. For example, I can put liquid in it and, uh, you know, and actually that's kind of about it. <laughs> Hot and it needs a handle. Well, the handle is optional, right? I've seen some mm -hmm. mugs that don't have a handle. So you just say like, you know, it's probably made of, Actually, it doesn't actually matter what material it is. Maybe like the only requirement of the standard is that it is a container that you can hold in your hands 
that has that can that could contain hot liquid. And how you make it is kind of up to you. Like you have a black mug, uh, I have a white mug, uh, <laughs> and they're both mugs. And they and like mine is straight, and yours is kind of like oval shape or you know curvy, curvy. shape. Uh, and they're both you know mugs, and they both like conform to the standard of what a mug is that we just described. So ERC seven twenty one is pretty much the same. It's saying like. In order for you to like meet these very basic requirements, uh, you are technically a non fungible token. But how you get there is kind of up to you. Like whether or not you want to breed cats, or there's tulips, or there's crypto fighters, or there's like uh, ether Pokemon. <laughs> like that is completely up to you. And how like these uh, these things like breed or fight or reproduce or whatever you want to call it, um, that is also entirely up to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it really does. Okay. So it's basically a set of guidelines. Um, that that's it. It's a set of guidelines, and how you get uh, your thing there is up to you. But it just has to meet a certain that's right certain guidelines. And there's a reason for why these certain guidelines exist. So, for example, one of our guidelines is that this mug has to have hot liquid because otherwise, I can't use it. So, for a lot of marketplaces that sell ERC seven twenty tokens, they rely on that token having these particular methods. Otherwise, they can't sell them. Because otherwise, the auction, uh, like you know, the auction uh, like framework or you know standard can't actually interact with your token. So it's like the bare minimum for your token to be able to interact with like the common marketplaces. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I guess CryptoKitties, like you said, was the first, I guess, instant of that particular standard, right? Did they create it or was it already created and they were just the first example? I think they were like I think their team actually was the first to actually like uh, start the standard. They were not the the only contributors to the standard, um, but they were the first to implement it. So I think they had a hand in both developing it and they were the first to actually use it. Fair enough. And yeah. is there like an approving committee or that says, yes, okay, we're gonna approve this. This is gonna be this is gonna be called ERC seven twenty one. Or Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you say that. So Ethereum is like a very decentralized sort of community. So nothing so everything's kind of met by consensus, meaning that like if enough people kind of nod their heads. <laughs> uh, and so it's funny that you say that because ERC seven twenty one is technically still in beta because not enough people agreed up upon it. And so there's still like a debate of whether or not the standard should have like certain methods or the naming has to be in a certain way. So it's actually still not like a solidified, you know, standard. <laughs> people sure. are still debating over certain nuances. That's, that's awesome. So guys, everybody who's watching this, we're talking about technology that is in beta. That is like <laughs> new <laughs> stuff, really new stuff. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. That's amazing. And so CryptoKitty started it four months ago, more or less? They started in, uh, they released, what was it, like late October, early November? Something like that. Yeah. And it just exploded straight oh, away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And like you said, there were others that started following that, yeah. um, that path. Uh, yeah. What are the, some of the ones that you, you like the most out of the ones that oh, followed that? I don't know if I, okay, I don't know if I can say like the most, um, but I can name a couple <laughs> that I think are interesting. So the first ones that I that I saw that came out after CryptoKitties Crypto were called um, Ethereumon, uh, which is like Pokemon on Ethereum. And they had this mechanism where they have a set number of Pokemon and you catch a Pokemon, but someone can also catch the same Pokemon. So if I'm the first person to catch the Pokemon, I pay the lowest price. So like, let's say 0 0.001 Ether. And then let's say you catch that same Pokemon. Well, actually, when you catch it, the price is slightly higher, 0 0.002. And you pay me back 0 0.001. And then the third person catches it for 0 0.003, and they have to pay back the last two people that bought it. And so actually, this game mechanism, even though people sort of liked it, uh, <laughs> it kind of follows a standard Ponzi scheme, uh, mm -hmm. like the pyramid scheme. And so the internet completely bashed them and they were like, you made a game that's a complete pyramid scheme, it's a Ponzi scheme, like we're not gonna play it. So they like 
uh, they genuinely apologize. Like the development team actually wrote this huge medium blog saying like, hey guys, like we're really sorry. <laughs> we're trying to fix this. <laughs> we're also new to the space. <laughs> oh my God. And they sort of, I, I think they sort of fixed it, but like by then the community kind of didn't like them enough. <laughs> so they kind of lost that. Um, so, but, but then what happened is that they started a new game mechanic of these like Ponzi scheme games. And so then there was like a bunch of these games that came out that had kind of a similar Ponzi scheme element. Um, and interestingly enough, if you look at the source code, because basically all these games post their source code uh, just on like publicly, uh, you see that they copy CryptoKitties contract almost like the like blatant like copy paste of the CryptoKitties contract, but they're using this like Ponzi scheme game because they realized that's how you make money really quick because mm -hmm. people get excited about them making money, <laughs> not realizing that every time they make a transaction, they're actually giving a portion of the transaction to the game developers. Yeah. Wow, that's very interesting. And I guess that's one of the aspects why people, that's an, another one of the, another, yeah, another aspect, sorry, you just keep on repeating myself. Um, another aspect why people might find uh, or might form an impression of blockchain and you know the games on blockchain as of a potentially suspicious area because these things can happen some people are i wouldn't say bad actors but actors are trying to get money quick yeah and the irony of this situation is i actually do believe the ethereum on team i think they actually introduced the game mechanic out of coincidence <laughs> or, or like out of a, like a genuine mistake um, but yeah, the moment they showed the world this is possible, it, you know, catapulted yeah. into... They <laughs> opened a gateway. That's right. <laughs> they <to> did. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, that's very interesting. And it's so interesting how this new technology gives so many more opportunities and engages so many people, especially those people who are active in the community and I guess are finding out about all these things straight mm -hmm. away. And so you've been working on a project yourself. Yeah. And I, you were showing it to me last time we spoke, and it looks amazing. It looks very cute. Um, I'm very excited for everybody who's watching and who's going to watch this in the recording um, to see this and to potentially use it themselves. Um, so, yeah, do you mind walking us through it and doing yeah. a little demo of what, you know, the ERC. 2721, ERC 721, or the non fungible or the collectible tokens. Yes. Everybody, uh, what they look like and, you know, why they're so different. Totally. Yeah. So, um, so as I was talking about like the history of other ERC 721 games, uh, basically my friends got together and we were like, hey, like we're noticing a bad pattern in these games where the pattern is like get rich quick and People are less interested about the actual game and more interested about like if they get in early, then they can make maybe some make some money out of the hype. And then like all the games are basically done in a way that um, like there's a calculated death, so to speak. You know, like like the game developers are aware of the fact that they're going to make a game that's going to have a hype for maybe a week or two and then it's going to die out. So there's like this mad rush to kind of get in early. Um, so that this Ponzi scheme element that most of these games have kind of kicks in and they get, I mean, they make some money out of it. So one weekend we like sat down and we we're like, what if we make like an honest game, <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's awesome. what if we make a game that actually has like function, um, and, uh, and kind of doesn't, doesn't necessarily have this, you know, get rich quick scheme. I mean, people can sell you know their non-fungible tokens that we create if they want to but we don't want to like make that the focus of the game if that makes sense so we looked at the problems of the ethereum blockchain and we said okay so um you know it's it said that the ethereum blockchain is anonymous but it's actually not because you can trace every transaction back to the wallet that first initiated that coin um, so, and it's a public ledger, so it's not hidden in any way. <laughs> so technically, uh, if you really want to, you can trace back any transaction and, and humans are creatures of habit. So even if a human has multiple wallets, they're probably going to have like one primary wallet that they transfer money into or out of. 
So, you know, if you do some analysis, you realize who you, like who that person is based on their primary wallet. So we thought, okay, so Ethereum is not anonymous, but if you look at your wallet number, you know, it's like 0x, you know, 33f7. It doesn't look very cute and doesn't look like you. <laughs> so, um, so we thought, okay, what if we actually make avatars for Ethereum? So you have a picture of you, uh, or it doesn't have to be a picture of you. It can be, you know, an avatar that you like that like sits in your wallet and it's unique because we're, you know, we're verifying basically in our smart contract that every creation is a, is a unique combination of components. Um, you know, it looks like you and it lives forever in your wallet unless of course you transfer it. Um, so yeah, that was our project. That was our motivation. That's awesome. And those avatars look very cute. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Very cute. <laughs> All right, so how do I, do I share my screen? Yes, you can just, just share, share your, screen. your screen. Okay. Okay, let's see if this works. Is this working? Yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is ethmoji.io. Um, and, you know, the front page kind of goes over how to actually make emoji. Uh, but once you start creating, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So you're given a view initially of uh, your base emoji. So if you're if you want a diff different skin color uh, or a different base, you can kind of choose that here. So what if I wanted to be a purple person for the day? <laughs> um, and I can add some some eyes, maybe uh, maybe some some these eyes. Uh, I can give it a mouth. Cute. There you go. <laughs> maybe I can give it some hair. Let's see. Oh, wow. oh that was good. Wow. Yeah. Or maybe a ponytail. Or let's see what else do we have here. Uh, this looks good too. There you go. Um, and then maybe I can give it some eyebrows. <laughs> I love it. Uh, oh, maybe I can give it a blush. There you go. <laughs> Uh, we probably don't need mustaches, but uh, you know, if <laughs> but it's an option. Know, it's an option. <laughs> That's right. Um, ooh, we can give some purple eyeglasses to a purple lady. There you go. <laughs> nice. Um, and let's see what else can we do. Uh, I guess we can give her a wizard hat, but it doesn't quite fit here. Uh, or a unicorn. <laughs> also doesn't quite work here. Um, we can give a little heart. There you go. Um, yeah, so the, basically that's kind of the idea. And if that's the avatar that I want, I would say, okay, I'm going to finish composing. And that would be my price for it. If I wanted to go back, uh, I could. Um, and I can also, just to get inspired, I can look at some other uh, emojis that have been created. So, oh, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so these are basically emojis that other people have created. Uh, if I wanted to kind of get an idea of what I can make. Uh, Paul looks really good there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this kind of this view kind of gives me an idea of what people are creating. And also if I see, for example, like Dylan, like, oh, I actually really like those eyes, for example, I can click here and I can click, I can see all the components that make up that particular emoji. And I can click on a component that I really like. Like, let's say I really like those eyes. Like, I want to use those eyes. So I can actually click on Compose. Um, and those eyes would already kind of be there. I guess you can't quite see them. But there, there you go. <laughs> so I can start composing with those eyes if I want to. You know. <laughs> Surprise, <laughs> Aubergine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, actually... Uh, let's see, over the mouse. So this emoji in particular, I've actually already created this one. And as you can see, the finish emoji button is now grayed out because we know that this composition already existed. Um, and I know for a fact that this exists because I made it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but this is just to show you that like the system basically won't allow you to make uh, emojis that have been previously created mm -hmm. um, because we really care about uniqueness and we want to make sure that, you know, if you buy this emoji uh, to be your avatar, it, like there's only one of them out there. So there you go. Um, do you have any more questions? Yeah, actually about the uniqueness part. So what if, uh, you know, because there are only so many combinations that you can have. Mm -hmm. So once 
people create a lot of combinations and potentially the it's very limited um the the, the amount of the, the the amount of emojis that they can make mm -hmm. um is very limited would you what would you guys do would you start adding new hats for example or new mustaches just so that they can create those unique um combinations yeah. Yeah, it's an excellent question, and that's one that we've been thinking about a lot. Um, we have a couple ideas of how to do that. We want to kind of like understand how the how the community responds to this first. Um, and what we were initially thinking, um, and I don't want to, you know, like we might not go with this plan, so I don't want to kind of. Oh, whoops. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Let me go back to my view. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah. So we were thinking of kind of giving the community community a way to present their base emojis. Um, so basically all the emojis that you, that you saw uh, were like, you know, individual components. We call those base emojis because you can compose your emoji with these base emojis. Um, and we were initially thinking of a way for the community to actually contribute to these base emojis. Um, <clears throat> and we haven't actually built out the system for that yet. That's still, we're still thinking about that idea, but it's very important for us to have the community involved. Um, like we want to make sure, uh, you know, if we want, if we are going to become like the gravatar for Ethereum, you know, we're a small team. Um, we want to make sure that we get more diverse kind of contributors to our, you know, art set. So if there are people in the community that present, you know, uh, base emojis that we did not even think of, like, you know, of course we're going to add them um, just because, we want the community to contribute. Of course, yeah, that's that's awesome. And so once somebody creates their uh, emoji, they can buy the components and yes. they own that uh, specific emoji. Can they go back then and, for example, let's say I got a haircut and I feel like I identify with a different hairstyle. <laughs> Could I go back <laughs> and um, change my emoji's hair, hairstyle? Oh, that's a good question. Unfortunately, I can't do that yet. Um, and, and maybe yet is the wrong word. Maybe never, unfortunately. And that's because when we create your uh, composition, there's a very particular hash associated with a composition that makes it unique. Um, and if you change it, then, you know, that hash would be invalid and that wouldn't work. So unfortunately, in order to, like, preserve uniqueness, uh, we kind of had to... Uh, you know, think about a lot of our product decisions. So that's one thing that you can't do. Like once you have your emoji, it's pretty much set in stone. Fair enough. And that's and that's going back to the fact that it's an ERC721 token. And in order to have it in a unique marketplace, they have to be unique. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so fair. all tokens are unique. Um, yeah. And that kind of also has an element of scarcity. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's this many tokens uh, with this many combinations. Um, and this many like, you know, logical combinations for like blonde hair, for example, or like only find that of, you know, logical combinations for like blonde curly hair or, or like whatever you think like the scarce element is. Um, and yeah, and, like we think it's kind of, it's kind of cool. And, you know, if somebody wants, they can, uh, you know, make a lot of these avatars um, and, you know, cool looking avatars and they can sell them. And we think that's actually a good thing because you as a creator, like if you created something that other people want, yeah, like of course we should allow you to sell it. So every time you make this emoji, um, well, one thing that I forgot to show you is that you can actually automatically trade it on OpenSea, which is a marketplace for non-fungible tokens. Um, so, and uh, the first emoji you make automatically becomes your avatar. You can set any other emoji that you buy in the future to be your avatar. Um, and we're trying to get websites to actually agree to use these things. So OpenSea is the first one that actually is working with us. So if you go to OpenSea.com and you, sorry, OpenSea.io, <laughs> and you make an account, that automatically becomes your avatar. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. And for example, back to my uh, previous question, if, for example, somebody has already made uh, an avatar with that haircut that you want, and they're potentially selling it on the marketplace, you mm -hmm. could buy that emoji because yes. it's unique, right? That's, right? that's that's how you're creating value at the end of the day because somebody wants that one. That's right, exactly. 
avatar. And you could sell yours as well, because maybe there's someone else, maybe you think it has value and somebody else will buy it. And from what I understand, the OpenSea.io is in auction, right? Yes, exactly. So OpenSea.io is kind of like the eBay for these non-fungible tokens. So that's a place where you can buy your crypto kitties, your like crypto fighters and ethmoji now. So pretty exciting. That's awesome. That's yeah. that's really, really cool. Um, I haven't played around with it, but now that yeah, <laughs> I just want to play around with it uh, yeah. straight away. And Compose uh, View is very addicting. Like you just kind of get stuck in there for hours thinking of like what, you know, crazy combinations you can make. Seriously, I yeah, I'm I'm very excited. So, um, guys, everybody who's watching this, you can check out Ethmoji. There's a link uh, in the description, and I will share my avatar with you sometime yes. next week, um, for sure, um, because I'll have a lot of time to uh, to make them next week. <laughs> um, I'll be in Moscow, so I'll be. Oh, yeah. nice! Yeah, I'm going to Moscow. Well, it's really fun. It's Thursday. Yeah, very, I'm very excited. I'm going to be sharing it on stories and stuff like that because wow. I usually do touristy stuff when I go back. <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's get back to blockchain. Away from Moscow, <laughs> blockchain. <laughs> okay, okay. Elena, how did you get into this field? I know we've spoken about it, but can you share with my audience how did you first get into this field? Just That's such a hard question. <laughs> Um, no, that is actually a very hard question. Um, I think the first thing that really excited me was actually this technology called IPFS, stands for Interplanetary File System. Um, and I know it's a at all. <laughs> grand name, grand name, um, but it's actually a very cool piece of tech. So it basically uh, allows you to have decentralized storage. Um, and so uh, it's kind of, I mean, it's taking a lot of inspiration from BitTorrent back in the days. Uh, I guess BitTorrent still exists, so I shouldn't say that. Um, it's taking a lot of inspiration from decentralized hash tables, and uh, if you have, if there are any coders out there and you guys have heard of GitHub, uh, it's a repository system that has, um, you know, like basically a chain <laughs> uh, of commits. So the the TLDR is that they're decentralized storage, um, and what's really cool about that is that. If you want to store a file or a piece of information that, for example, your government doesn't allow you to store, or that the government, for example, blocks, uh, you can. And in this decentralized storage space, it's uncensored and it's available to all. So, for example, in Spain, um, <laughs> when uh, <laughs> they had their, you know, political uh, disagreement, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you know, they actually hosted a website on IPFS to figure out how to um, register people to vote, if I remember correctly, uh, in such a way that the government uh, wouldn't be able to disallow. Um, and this example actually, like they're, they're, they had a different example as well. Um, but yeah, and I thought that was like extremely inspiring. <laughs> uh, and so... I, I went to my first hackathon for cryptocurrency in Waterloo. It was called ETH Waterloo, which ironically is where CryptoKitties kind of like, you know, also presented their product. <laughs> so, that was the so first cool. time they presented it. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and uh, I was just blown away by how tight knit the community was. Um, it's, you know, blockchain technology is very new and there's a lot of players in this field. But what's really inspiring is that no one's really competing with one another. Everyone's actually trying to help one another. Like, like we all like are all in this boat together <laughs> and we're thinking, okay, we know that this technology can, is extremely powerful, but it's also, it's, it's kind of immature and we're trying to get it to, you know, uh, to be like production ready to actually help the world. And so there's not that much competition. Like everyone is actually genuinely trying to help each other, which I thought was like amazing. So I was like, wow, I want to be a part of this community. So that's how that happened. <laughs> that's awesome. And how did you learn? Because it's one thing to start learning about it, but how did you learn um, how to actually develop stuff in it? Because I'm sure some people in the audience will be curious about learning more about Solidity, for example, which is a language. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you're, you got it. Yeah. Um, so that's actually an excellent question. There is like a documentation out there of how to learn Solidity. Um, and it's gotten better now. Uh, there are actually like websites where 
you can you know do tutorials and kind of gain more knowledge um but it's still pretty pretty sparse it's still fairly hard to find documentation um there's not that many stack overflow questions <laughs> you know there are some don't get me wrong and, and the ones that are up there are very useful um but it's still kind of a hard field to get into so for me personally i just i'm like a very hands-on person i was like all right i'm just gonna start you know following all the tutorials that i can and kind of like typing typing <laughs> that's right <laughs> um so like that's <clears throat> that's basically how i learned and uh, the Solidity documentation is all online, and I've never really like read documentation to be perfectly honest. But because there isn't anything out like else out there, if I stumble upon a problem, I actually read the documentation. I was like, wow, I should have done this more <laughs> often because as you read the documentation, you actually understand like why the language behaves the way the way it does for a particular reason. Um, so yeah, it's it's still pretty it's just, it's like still pretty mature kind of field. So. Uh, there isn't a ton out there, but there, but it's getting a lot better. Fair enough. But that's so cool uh, just to see how, you know, a lot of people who are starting out, they're, they're, they get intimidated by the fact that there's so many people who are already really good at whatever language they're trying to learn, right? Mm -hmm. And you're obviously very good in the backend languages, but when learning something new, you were also in that, beginner uh beginner shoes mm -hmm. and you were learning by doing which is yeah. a lot of the times what everybody needs to do whenever whenever it comes to any language yeah for sure uh yeah solidity is pretty interesting because most people in the space are new or like you know or they started learning maybe a year ago um the majority of the people that you will meet you know their timeline they started maybe a year ago um so don't get intimidated is what I'm trying to say. Like almost everyone you meet is new. <laughs> uh, and if they're not new, they're pretty new. <laughs> um, so yeah, and like, like I said earlier, like this community is very welcoming. If you find a team or a project that you are really passionate about, that you really like, uh, reach out to them. Like they probably have a Slack or a Discord or like even GitHub issues or Telegram or whatever. Um, reach out to them and say like, hey, I'm really passionate about your tech. I want to learn more. I don't understand X, Y, Z. Can you explain to me X, Y, Z? And they will do that. <laughs> like they really will. That's awesome. That's that's really really valuable when people are so just passionate about others, joining the community and helping them learn. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's amazing. And yeah. I really hope that there will be more women in the area in the industry. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, there was one tweet that I'm pretty. I'm probably going to butcher, but. Uh, it was a quote, something along the lines of like, you know, cryptocurrency might be the next, you know, big opportunity of wealth and we can't afford women not to participate in it. And I think that's extremely true. Fair enough. Fair enough. And do, um, I've heard that actually Twitter is a very, very big area um, or a very big playing field for the cryptocurrency community. Is that probably the best way to find out um, about the crypto uh, mm -hmm. slash blockchain um, news? I don't actually know. I'm ashamed to admit that I'm not a big Twitter user. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't answer that question. To be honest, I'm on the same boat with you. I have a Twitter, but I barely use it. So um, yeah, I'm yeah. there with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I heard people do get a lot of information out of Twitter. Um, I get my information from uh, Telegram, so there are multiple like you know reading groups or you know discussion groups about crypto, and you just kind of like passively, you know, hear what people are talking about, and you're like, oh, I haven't heard of this project. Let me Google that. <laughs> That's kind of how I learned. <laughs> that is very interesting um, because yeah, in Russia, um, whenever I go back, everybody is on these Telegram channels. <laughs> Seriously, my dad reads. And he's in communication, so mm -hmm. he reads so many different uh, Telegram channels. And he's like, "Mush, you su should subscribe to this. You should subscribe to mm -hmm. this." And I'm like, "I have no time to read this stuff." It's, <laughs> but I guess for uh, blockchain, it's also a a big channel as well, right? Do you yeah. think it was um, affected by the fact that you know Telegram is so used by Russians, and <laughs> there is quite a large proportion of them in the crypto world i i don't know exactly what started it i think what 
probably started is that um, Telegram is secure or you can send encrypted messages. Um, and I'm not actually sure what the status of that is. <laughs> like, I'm not sure exactly how encrypted they are, but I think that's kind of what got people excited to use it in the first place. Um, I don't know why it was the winner, you know, in comparison to Signal or Keybase or some of the other encrypted message uh, chat platforms. But somehow it's like, you know, it was the the place where you make your uh, your group. Um, and I think, yeah, like I have no idea how they did it, <laughs> but they seem to be the most popular platform right now for uh, crypto discussion groups. Fair enough. That's that, uh, that's that's really really interesting how that. Yeah, but thank you so so much. This has been unbelievably helpful for me, and I hope for people who are watching this. Um, I saw uh, there's been quite a discussion on the um, on the chat, and some people have tried your um, your app already. Um, so yeah, um, how would you? So to go forward, how would you um, recommend for people to? I don't know, get in contact with you if they want to to chat, um, or you know, just. Yeah. Uh, any any uh, words for using your platform? Uh, yeah, so we have a Discord channel, um, and the link is in uh, is in on the website. But let me actually give you the link right here as well. So awesome! I'll put it in the channel. description. So if people have problems or questions or concerns or comments, um, that would be the place to go. Awesome! And would would you uh, would they be able to find you there? Yes. I have awesome. my avatar so they can tell who I am. <laughs> okay. So I can um I can share your name with them and um they can find you if they want That's to right. reach you. And yep. also in terms of ethmoji, how would you want people to use it? Any words of encouragement and all that? Um our our uh, our hash or our, our line is unleash your inner emoji. So be creative. Uh, it doesn't have to look like you. If you want it to look like you, that's awesome. If not, like, be creative. Uh, just have fun with it. And uh, we don't know where it's going to go. It's extremely in beta, but we're excited of the opportunities that we can uh, that we can make with this. So, yeah, my best advice is to have fun. <laughs> that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, have fun, guys. This is a new technology. Uh, this is a new, exciting field. And um, yeah, just, yeah. I'm, I'm so, I, I don't know. I'm just so excited about these things, especially when they're just at the brink of potentially changing the world, <laughs> disrupting a lot of different industries. Yeah. Uh, but I've added the link to the that group, and I've shared your name on the description. So. Anybody who's watching live, you can already go and uh, see that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think we'll probably um, end here because there's just been so much incredible knowledge and incredible <laughs> tips. Thank you so much, Elena. Yeah, um, and as always, it's just so nice to talk to you. Aww, you know, thank you. Like, and some people said that you have this great sense of humor and I love your smile. Amazing. I, I wish I could work on a team with you because I think Aww, be, uh, That's I'm, so sweet. I'm so glad to hear it. Thank you so much. This has been really fun. It really has been. Thank you so much, guys. We're going offline now. Have a wonderful time of the day you're currently experiencing. Bye. <laughs>